Good morning, everyone. The topic of today's webinar is COVID-19 and specifically the bioinformatics of infectious diseases. So we wanna to speak today about how viral genomes that are found in host samples, different hosts, uh, how we can identify, what can we learn about their genomic similarity, and what kind of considerations do we have to keep in mind when we study potential host reservoirs of emerging viral strains that can lead to a pandemic such as the COVID-19. This webinar uh, is brought to you by Pine Biotech. We are a biotechnology company that is working with multiple academic and commercial collaborators to develop easy to use analytical tools um, and our mission is to make bioinformatics more accessible. We do this by providing training and tools um, that help people make discoveries using next generation sequencing and other types of high throughput omics data. In the context of this webinar, we'll be looking at publicly available genomic data, talk in detail about some of the tools that are required to use uh, such type of data, and also highlight several elements that can be studied to understand zoonotic transmission. So I hope that everyone that is joining today is already here. Um, we will um, record this webinar and we will provide the recording of this webinar after it's complete. If you have any questions about any of the topics that we're gonna be covering today, I encourage you to put your questions in the chat and we will pause uh, during specific breaks in the presentation to address your comments. Uh, now, to make sure that we will go through this presentation in the time that we've allocated, um, we will um, try to respond to the questions that we don't have time to cover in the session later on. So please make sure to pay attention to the emails coming from our team. Unlike previous outbreaks, the COVID-19 epidemic brought with it a huge collection of data that has been made publicly available and accessible on such repositories as the National Center for Biotechnology Information or NCBI. In fact, if we look at the speed that this data has been made available at, we will find that COVID-19 outbreak has generated approximately five times more full genomes compared to four previous major outbreaks, including SARS-1 of 2002, Ebola of 2014, as well as Zika and MERS of 2015. So what you see on this chart is the number of full assembled genomes per month on average. Uh, these are primarily human hosts on NCBI virus database. And what you can see is that if we break this down year by year, there is definitely an acceleration. Uh, as you can see, SARS in 2002, uh, from then, from 2002 till now, there's about 216 months. On average, and in total, we have 481 fully assembled genomes. So it's an average 2.2 genomes per month. Um, and as we progress from there, we get to all the way to almost 25 genomes uh, per month. Uh, because we have such a short time frame. So what this means is not necessarily that the amount of data is so vastly different, but the speed at which this data is uh, produced and made accessible. So we see this as a result of accelerated pace of sequencing, availability, availability of next generation sequencing technologies throughout the different locations in the world, and widespread appreciation of the accuracy and detail that such data can provide us so that we can study infectious diseases. And all of these factors have contributed to a large number of life scientists around the world that turn to bioinformatics to try and make sense of such data and what it can tell us about these emerging pathogens. So due to this increased interest, Training in bioinformatics is an important step to start mining available data and effectively utilize bioinformatics tools. To support methods and data types that are provided in publicly, in publicly available repositories from recent outbreaks, we have designed a full program that is going to cover in a comprehensive way bioinformatics approaches for biologists, clinicians, students, and researchers 
to be able to effectively utilize bioinformatics methods to study this kind of data. The program will provide hands-on training using several different viruses as examples. And you can see here some of those examples, coronavirus, flu, Ebola, uh, rhinovirus, polio, and others. So you have in chat there a link to this program if you're interested. And briefly to introduce the program, I'm just going to talk about this specific session that it has been extracted from some of the similar topics that we will cover in the program. So we assembled a series of short lectures that we offer as free webinars, specifically on the content on the context of COVID-19. Uh, but they have been extracted from this full two month long program. Uh, we also had some previous webinars that we held on this topic and they're available on our YouTube channel. Uh, and we encourage you to review some of those sessions if you're interested in the origins and pathogenesis of COVID-19 and how to use some of the associated bioinformatics methods to study this type of genomic and transcriptomic data. So in this session, we'll speak about SARS-CoV-2, the SARS coronavirus 2, and the disease that it causes that can be characterized by a set of very specific features. And we can call this process pathogenesis. We will discuss how zoonotic spillover or transmission between animal hosts and humans can explain some of these disease characteristics and how determining the origins of this disease can help inform us on the dangers as well as prevention measures that have to be considered in the future. And then finally, we will discuss some of the data sets, tools, and specific considerations that link the biology of viral origin and transmission, as well as replication, including cell entry, endocytosis, and evasion of the immune system that are significant factors for vaccine design and antiviral drug development and repurposing. In a recent publication titled SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 by the numbers that was uh, published by uh, Yinon Baron, Avi Flamholtz, Rob Phillips, and Ron Milo from the Weizmann Institute of Science, University of California, Berkeley, and California Institute of Technology, as well as the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, uh, we find a number of uh, kind of uh, considerations that have been extracted from a series of numbers published in different and variety, a whole set of publications. And they show some of the characteristics of the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. So um, some of the uh, findings there are related to the genome of the virus, um, and some of them are related to other factors considered for the pathogenesis of the virus, the viral entry, and how it can adapt between different hosts. So what we will see is that a lot of these numbers come from publicly available data sets that all of us can have access to as well. And we'll talk a little bit more on how to find those data sets and how to evaluate such numbers from a data perspective uh, using efficient bioinformatics tools and how can we develop a framework to study emerging pathogens like SARS-CoV-2 utilizing some of the same tools used in such publications. So during this session, I will refer to a collection of tools that are typically used for such research. We'll be demonstrating a little bit of how some of these tools could be utilized by uh, leveraging the T-BioInfo platform. The platform was developed by the Tauber Bioinformatics Research Center at University of Haifa in Israel. And during the program on bioinformatics for infectious diseases, all participants will have the opportunity to utilize this cloud-based user-friendly and intuitive bioinformatics platform to understand the logic of such analysis and then to understand how the same tools could be uh, deployed in different environments or how the platform itself could be used for uh, detailed interrogation of such data, integration and interpretation of such bioinformatics analysis. Specifically, the, util the utility of this platform is for large data sets. So you can compare several genomes on your own computer, but once you get into the hundreds of genomes that are available for these outbreaks, having a cloud-based environment is going to play a big difference in how flexible your design of your analysis can be. 
So some of the um, aspects of this platform include analysis of RNA-seq data um, and the importance of RNA-seq in the context of viral uh, studies uh, is to be able to process large scale data that has gene expression information on, for example, cell response to viral infection. Uh, we will also talk about network analysis and machine learning that could be used for data mining and how to identify specific gene sets, as well as signaling and expression pathways, and how we can study their variation across different conditions. These tools provide flexibility and efficiency because they combine the logic of analysis, in other words, why we are selecting specific steps in our pipeline, as well as you can easily try and uh, uh, use them for different project data sets. And so we've prepared some curated data sets. What you see here is a collection of cell line based experiments that demonstrate the differences in response of the cell immune system, the innate immunity, to the way that the virus replicates in different modifications of the virus. So we can really study complex relationships and analyze this data efficiently when we have access to such tools. Today, however, we will speak a little bit more about mutation variants. These mutation variants can be studied by looking at a reference. So we can compare multiple genomes to a reference, or we can really organize them into different groups and study variation between groups. And so some of those important aspects are available under the mutation variance section of the platform that we will take a look at today. And um, we can organize these data sets by different types of information that we will look at today in the NCBI virus database. These types of comparisons can really help reveal important variation between key protein domains that are important for viral infection and can be different between hosts. And so we'll take one of these examples today and kind of try to replicate that kind of a study and see what those results are going to show us. These differences can also be studied from an evolutionary standpoint. And that means that we can study genome-wide or protein-specific variation that can indicate a common origin or characterize relationship and even arrive at an evolutionary distance between samples, which of course is very important in the context of origin, right? How do we know of an origin? We can study the evolutionary relationship, what came from what, and maybe a common uh, host that was the origin of two different strains can reveal important information that we can then leverage in our analysis. Uh, these uh, relationships, of course, require finding and collecting specific groups of data that can answer these types of questions with a high degree of confidence. So we will look today into how such data can be found and validated and used in an analysis that actually uh, you can be confident in. Uh, to help with this process, we will also refer to a number of online visualization tools that you can use to speed up the process of exploration, right? So it's important to link these different levels of information, starting from genomic variants to the proteins and understand the relationship between nucleotide level, amino acid level, and protein level information that really reveals the significant areas um, that we should focus on in the analysis. We'll also take a look at how an advanced comparison between multiple hosts can reveal those types of areas where we might focus in terms of downstream steps of characterizing an infection process, uh, finding uh, important areas for different protein domains, um, and then also understanding the factors related to that process. Other tools that we will not be able to use in this session, but we'll discuss them in the future, provide the capability of using this uh, detailed data from controlled experiments to use mathematical modeling and simulation for the study of virus-specific processes, such as replication. Um, such in silico studies can help identify important factors that affect replication, interference, and outcomes of viral infection. The data from these experiments can vary significantly um, and can include next generation sequencing, but also cell microscopy and even animal studies where high throughput data 
uh, requires automated technologies to find and quantify the characteristic pattern. And finally, um, a lot of these uh, data sets will point to a whole area of in silico drug design where molecular structures and their physical chemical characteristics can be compared at the structural level and are going to be important for both vaccine and antiviral drug design. So our team is working with several collaborators to continue and expand the way such methods are incorporated into our online platform and could be utilized effectively even for people that do not have a significant engineering background. So to start learning about some of these tools and some of these methods, we've prepared a collection of online resources that could be studied for free. Um, some of them uh, priced very low for anyone to be able to understand how some of these tools are applied to different types of data, genomic, transcriptomic, metagenomic data, and also leveraging the tools and the online materials, we design these specific uh, specialization tracks or programs, including this upcoming program, the Bioinformatics for Infectious Diseases. So um, if you're interested to learn about all of these different aspects of bioinformatics for infectious diseases, we welcome you to join this upcoming program. And uh, you can start the registration process by visiting the um, link that Liebscher has placed in chat uh, with their pre-registration form. Okay, so now let's uh, start talking specifically about COVID-19, the novel coronavirus, uh, also called SARS-CoV-2. Um, it has emerged unexpectedly sometime in 2019. And it was first identified in China, but also this is by far not the first coronavirus that caused major concerns. So concerns about coronaviruses have emerged previously, and good examples of those previous outbreaks are SARS and MERS that have significantly lower infectivity rates, but much higher mortality rates. Um, for example, MERS has a fatality rate of 34 to 35%, SARS 10 to 11% and SARS-CoV-2 uh, between three and four, perhaps even lower as we have larger sample size today of testing. So many people compared originally SARS-CoV-2 to flu, but we can see here that this virus is also very different from, this, from the flu virus in terms of its epidemiological characteristics. So let's try to understand how these characteristics could be found in data. And we have a question here, does the COVID-19 virus change the genetic composition according to their host? It's a great question. We'll get to that in just a second. So the way that this virus causes disease is what commonly is known as ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, in SARS, uh, you also find the same letters, obviously, um, acute respiratory syndrome. Um, and this respiratory distress is caused by accumulation of fluid and cellular debris in lung alveoli, where the lungs bring blood to facilitate exchange of uh, CO2 and oxygen. The rapid collapse of alveoli function combined with the strong immune response the virus causes makes this condition acute. So recently publications started showing additional aspects of SARS infection. These reports point to infiltration of the immune cells by SARS-CoV-2 virus and what's called a cytokine storm caused by the inflammatory response. Such response is unusual for respiratory viruses and is more closely associated with viruses that target immune cells, such as HIV. And this by, uh, uh, this uh, actually comes from uh, an article published in Nature on April 6th, so just recently, a couple of review articles. So one of the questions that we can start thinking about in the context of this unusual coronavirus is how does this family of coronaviruses and the specific strains of coronaviruses differ between different animal hosts where they might potentially originate from? And we can look at the question that was proposed by Abhinimayu Kumar here. Uh, does the COVID-19 virus change the genetic composition according to the host, right? So I think a very interesting question. But what other elements do we need to consider about these hosts? So the differences between these hosts could be measured at different levels. Obviously, they are different in size, 
They have different metabolic processes. For example, bats have much higher and faster metabolism than humans. Uh, they have also a different immune response. And that means that they possess their own microbiome, their own environment of microbes that include viruses. And we can see how the different stresses that they uh, um, put on the different uh, pathogens that they might carry actually help shape those different genetic compositions that we will look at in the context of coronaviruses in animals and coronaviruses as they uh, interact with the human host. So to start talking about this, uh, let's just define kind of uh, what are these members of the coronavirus family. So coronaviruses are members of the subfamily coronaviridae in the family coronaviridae. And the common human coronaviruses include types 229E, NL63, OC43, and HKU1. You can see some of those right here. A lot of these usually cause mild to moderate upper respiratory tract illnesses like the common cold. Most people get infected with one or more of these viruses at some point of their lives, right? So what, what's important here is that potentially all of us here in this webinar have had an interaction with this virus at some point in our lives. Um, based on the phylogenetic relationship and genomic composition or structure of the COVID-19, it belongs to the genera beta coronavirus, which has a close similarity of COVID-19 between COVID-19 to the severe acute respiratory syndrome related coronavirus or SARS, SARS-1. And uh, the SARS outbreak, um, uh, the coronavirus study group of the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses termed the virus SARS-CoV-2. And the understanding of the genetic and phenotypic structure of COVID-19 in pathogenesis is important for our ability to produce drugs and vaccines. Uh, so uh, understanding the relationships between these different strains and species of viruses is going to be very important for us to understand how to prevent such an outbreak in the future, how to appropriately respond, and how to learn from this uh, data that is being collected so that in the future, our response could be more rapid and more effective. Uh, a lot of these coronaviruses, as you can see, they do not infect humans, but they primarily infect different animals from bovine, cows, and, and uh, animals like that, to feline, for example, cats, uh, to, for example, bats um, and pangolins. Uh, but all of these are mam mammals, right? And so what's common between these mammals is that they all have specific cell receptors that allow this virus to enter inside the cell and utilize the cellular machinery to produce itself, to replicate. And so we will look today at how specific entry points into the cell are key to the understanding of transmission between the different hosts. So to speak about that, let's talk briefly about the genome. Coronaviruses possess the largest genomes. that are between 26 kilobases and 31 kilobases, which means 26,000 nucleotides to about 31.7 nucleotides. This is the longest among all known RNA viruses uh, with GC content varying from 32 to 43 percent. Variable numbers of small ORFs uh, so you will see here that there is a polyprotein uh, and uh, different open reading frames, ORFs, are present between the various conserved genes. So these are ORF1AB, spike, envelope, membrane, and nucleocapsid. And in downstream to the nucleocapsid gene in different coronaviruses lineages. So SARS-CoV-2 has a single strand positive sense RNA genome that codes for 10 genes ultimately producing 26 proteins according to the NCBA, NCBI annotation. So how can it be that 10 genes code for over 20 proteins? One long gene, ORF1AB, encodes a polyprotein that is cleaved into 16 proteins by proteases that are themselves part of the polyprotein. So in other words, this section right here, polyprotein, 
can be cleaved into multiple elements, multiple uh, portions of the protein by proteases that are also encoded in this sequence. Um, sorry, there are some questions here. Uh, does the global warming have a role in appearing of this virus? Does the sequence of SARS-CoV-2 in humans of different geographical areas is same or not? Uh, so this is very um, important, I think, for us to talk about in the future. Um, I think, you know, some of the um, importance of the environment is something we will look at. We'll also look at how to study differences and take a look at where we can find data. So um, definitely we'll address this as well uh, in a few minutes. So uh, the, um, these genes, right? So let's briefly speak about the genes that uh, are produced by this genome. The remaining genes predominantly code for structural components of the virus. The spike protein, which binds to the cognate receptor in a human or animal cell, a nucleoprotein that packages the genome, and two membrane-bound proteins. Through, uh, though much current work is centered on understanding of the role of accessory proteins in the viral life cycle, we estimate that it is currently possible to ascribe clear biochemical or structural functions to only about half of SARS-CoV-2 gene products. So what's important to understand about single strand RNA viruses right here is that they have a very high mutation rate. Um, and so the remarkable capacity of some of these viruses to adapt to new hosts and environments is highly dependent on their ability to generate de novo diversity in a short period of time, right? So this is a rate of mutation. Rates of spontaneous mutation vary amply among viruses. RNA viruses mutate faster than DNA viruses. Single-stranded viruses mutate faster than double-strand viruses. And genome size appears to correlate negatively with mutation rate. So that means that the longer the genome, the shorter the mutation rate. Viral mutation rates are modulated at different levels, including polymerase fidelity, sequence context, template secondary structure, cellular microenvironment, replication mechanisms, proofreading, and access to post-replicative repair. Additionally, massive numbers of mutations can be introduced by some virus-encoded diversity-generating elements, as well as by host-encoded cytidine adenine deaminases. Our current knowledge of viral mutation rates indicates that viral genetic diversity is determined by multiple virus and host dependent processes, and that viral mutation rates can evolve in response to specific selective pressures, right? So remember, we were talking about differences between animal and human hosts. And what we know today is that those different host environments at the cell and at the organism level produce different pressures on the virus to utilize this mechanism of mutation. And so as we will see, this, uh, these different pressures can actually produce a virus that is highly infectious in the absence of those uh, specific mechanisms that suppress replication in a specific virus. So studying viral evolution, researchers commonly use two measures describing the rate of genomic change. The first is evolutionary rate, which is defined as the average number of substitutions that become fixed per year in strains of the virus, given in units of mutations per site per year. The second is the mutation rate, which is the number of substitutions per site per replication cycle. Right? So one is per year, how many changes accumulate per year. Another one is how many accumulate per replication cycle. And so how can we relate these two values? If we have a single site at the end of a year, the only measurement of a mutation rate in a beta coronavirus suggests, suggests that this site will accumulate 10 to the third hours, and so there are 10 cycles per year. Multiplying the mutation rate by the number of replications and neglecting the potential effects of evolutionary selection and drift, we arrive at 10 to the, to the third mutations per site per year, consistent with the evolutionary rate inferred from sequenced coronavirus genome. So again, we can look at these genomes to estimate the rate of mutation. And so we see that this virus undergoes a near continuous replication in the wild, consistently generating new mutations, 
that accumulate over the course of the year. So in other words, we will see, we will see that the virus is uh, continuously changing in hosts. Different hosts are producing different rates of mutation, and that's how we can study the origin of the virus. So let's consider this question. What is the origin of the novel coronavirus? By looking at how these different processes of mutations per replication cycle, as well as the sudden transitions between hosts can potentially explain how this virus originated. So we have the original genome that was published um, in, uh, um, that represents the novel coronavirus uh, SARS-2. Um, we have the sequence of the full genome and we have the specific uh, genes that encode for different pro uh, proteins. And we have a hypothesis, right? The hypothesis, again, we are taking this hypothesis from a published paper uh, that we have SARS-CoV-2 uh, that is similar phylogenetically to a, uh, a common SARS-1, a bad SARS-1 coronavirus. So we suspect the bat to be the primary host because it is a reservoir of uh, different viruses that are known to have appeared in the past, like with SARS um, and other coronaviruses. And we suspect that there might be an indirect, uh, another link in this transmission in an intermediate host. And we'll talk about how do we find those and how do we evaluate the reasons behind these types of conclusions. So the publication that we will follow to answer this question is to compare the novel coronavirus genome sequence to other genomes coming from these different hosts. We will specifically follow a publication that was published in March um, in Nature Medicine uh, by a number of authors um, that took, uh, you can see here, a very specific collection of genomes, a couple from human hosts. So we have the SARS-CoV-2 and the SARS-CoV, so the original SARS and the novel SARS, three genomes from bats, and one from pangolin. And you will see how we can study the relationship between these different viral genomes at the whole genome level, which is here, the nucleotide whole genome level, as well as then specifically in areas of interest because we understand the biology of the viral replication. We will also utilize our knowledge of how viruses are engineered and how viruses typically come from hosts or spread between hosts to really make sure that our theory, our hypothesis, and the answer that we provide to support that hypothesis uh, makes both biological as well as data sense. So where do these viral genome sequences come from? Genomes are assembled from next generation sequencing, which is typically done using a process called shotgun sequencing. The process includes shattering the source material, either RNA or DNA, and then sequencing short reads that can range between 30 and 300 base pairs in length. These sequences are then assembled into a full genome by looking at a consensus in nucleotide sequence. In other words, if the sequence of reads all shows the exact same letters, they are considered to be the consensus. If there's a disagreement, the majority wins. As a result, from a single isolate or a single sample, we can get the full sequence of a viral genome that is most abundant in that specific sample. This process is fairly accurate. However, it reduces the diversity of potentially present variations of the virus in each sample to a single sequence. So the more samples we sequence, the higher is our confidence that a strain has consistent characteristics because we're always gonna be looking at this consensus based on majority. So after these sequences are found, sampled from different hosts, and then assembled into a full sequence, what we have access to, the majority of the data, the data that we will have access to, are these so-called assembled genomes. And sorry, there is a question here from Aisha. Yes, the recording of this webinar will be provided at the end. Uh, we will email it to everyone. So you can see that here are some examples of these novel coronavirus uh, sequences. 
And you can see that we can then organize the nucleotide sequence into what's called genomic structure. So we will use the structure of specific elements of this genome to then study variation. An approach to study this kind of variation is called multiple sequence alignment or MSA. And uh, what MSA stands for is the alignment of three or more biological sequences. They could be either protein sequences and amino acids, DNA, or RNA. In many cases, the input set of query sequences are assumed to have an evolutionary relationship by which they share a linkage and are descended from a common ancestor. From the resulting multiple sequence alignment, sequence homology can be inferred and phylogenetic analysis can be conducted to assess the sequence's shared evolutionary origins. So the relationship is based on time of evolution from a common origin. And we know this by knowing the rate of mutation that we spoke about recently. Okay, so a question here, why can't, why we can't answer alter the conformational changes in the cell surface receptor so that the virus doesn't recognize the receptor and doesn't bind it. Well, imagine you have millions of cells in your body and you want to um, change the receptor of all of those cells. Obviously, that's um, not possible. Okay, so uh, now we'll talk about specific molecules right so we have the whole genome so let's start from the whole genome and because we know that the mutation rate happens at the nucleotide level and so let's talk about some of these mutations first to understand what impact some of these mutations will have so mutations point mutations uh, are essentially substitutions insertions or deletions these are the possible changes at a single nucleotide level however they have a different impact on the outcome because these individual nucleotides code for codons, which are then used to make proteins. So if we think of this as uh, in the context of the central dogma of molecular biology, from DNA to transcription to mRNA to then translation to protein, we typically have a gene. That gene encodes for a sequence of codons and those codons are transferred to amino acid to protein level, right? So we'll follow the same idea and we'll see how these different mutations that we looked at here can produce different changes to different amino acids. And the differences in amino acid structure as well as physical chemical properties help us think about the impact of a single nucleotide mutation and characterize them in terms of their impact on the functionality. And that's where we want to focus when we talk about pathogenesis, because that's the changing of the uh, pathogenesis at the functional level. So we have this trinucleotide uh, combination that forms uh, different amino acids. And based on these relationships, we can now form an evolutionary relationship. So for example, what is an evolutionary relationship and how is it typically represented? We have present day species and we want to find the relationship between the present day species by thinking of how are they interrelated and assuming that there is somewhere in the uh, unobserved data some common origin where they might come from. And so we will see how we can characterize the relationship between these present day species samples that we will take, and we will take samples from different hosts, we will then look at relationships that are characterized as a phylogenetic tree. So for example, you're probably all familiar with uh, NextStrain, a project that combines all of the samples that are being uh, compiled from this outbreak and some of the previous ones. And a lot of times what we will see is a phylogenetic tree like this that demonstrates relationships. So here you can see different hosts, right? Bats, civets, chimpanzees, dogs, hedgehogs, etc. So we see different hosts, where they are coming from, which locations, and how are they related to each other, right? And you can see uh, that there's a very big diversity of these different viral strains. Where do we find this data? How can you and I find this data from publicly available resources? Um, these are some of the data sets found on um, virus, uh, NCBI virus um, 
uh, repository database. So we'll take a look at that in a second. So here, what kind of phenotypic information do we have about these viral strains? We can know what strain they belong to. These are typically annotated. The country of origin, host, virus species. And what's important about this is the GenBank accession number, which is an ID, uh, a sequence ID that we can then retrieve both the genomic information as well as the phenotypic information or the metadata about this uh, type of uh, sequence. So let's take a look at where we can find this. We can go to this link. Uh, let, let's go there together and just to take a look at what could be found. So we'll go to this link. Um, and what you will see when you go to this link is something that looks like this. And here you can go to search by virus. So here we will find a collection of different data sets. And we can simply put in Corona and we will see if you give it just a couple of minutes, a uh, second, sorry, um, some of the options that you can find. Uh, and these could be beta coronaviruses, alpha coronaviruses, the whole family coronaviridae, or you can look at um, other types of, for example, SARS-CoV-2 right here. So if you're asking the question, do these sequences differ between different uh, people uh, in different locations or different dates, you can ask this question by starting to analyze this data. If your question is, could I find different hosts? Again, you have the ability to take uh, different host level um, uh, and, and take a look at um, sequences from there. So obviously SARS-CoV-2 uh, would be specific to human host, but if you were to choose the whole beta coronaviruses, you would also find the bad coronaviruses. So how do we then to utilize this data and understand the relationships? A primary uh, collection of tools that we will use for this um, is found in on the platform that we will just briefly demonstrate. So let's go to the platform and I'll just do a quick demo of what we can do um, to um, study these kinds of viruses. So what I'll do today is use this section on virus quasi-species. Um, and we've prepared a number of these collections of data that you can use to understand how uh, the different viruses are related to each other. Um, and we can look here at um, this demo. So what we'll do is we'll uh, load up a collection of samples, then we will align them to each other using multiple sequence alignment, and then we will build a phylogenetic tree to understand how they are evolutionary related. So we'll click on start here. After we load them, we, um, okay, sorry, actually, this is um, study of uh, a human sample, so we'll do that at a later, later session. Let's take this uh, collection of data from different hosts. This is exactly the same analysis that was done in this paper. Um, then we will do multiple sequence alignments. So we'll align those sequences to each other to identify specific variation at the genomic level, at the nucleotide level. We will convert that information to amino acid level information so that we can study variation in codons some of them producing silent mutations, some of them producing uh, important mutations that change the amino acid. And then we will compare different types of evolutionary analyses, so different approaches to study evolutionary relationships to really understand the relationship between the samples at that evolutionary level. And to do that, we'll also use this approach of characterizing the different uh, trees that are produced by these methods and selecting the best ones that fit the data um, that we have. Again, we just click on end and we'll take a look here at the results. So in the meantime, there's a question. What are the reasons that in the same pandemic like COVID-19 sequences of viruses are different because it's been transferring from human to human once it has been transferred to the first human infected? Okay, so let's, we'll take a look at the data here in a second. And, you know, instead of hypothesizing, let's take a look at what's really found in the data. 
Okay, so as a result, we will have a set of outputs, and these outputs could be organized by the different methods that show us the phylogenetic relationship. For example, let's just download this and, and look at the result here. Um, what you can see is uh, the different accession numbers, right? You remember we talked about accession numbers. Um, and then we have a reference genome that we use as the reference. Um, and then we organize them into different groups, right? So group two, group one, group three, group four, right? And then we can see the distance from a common origin. So by quickly looking at these different accession numbers, we can link the accession number to a phenotype, to what we know of the sample, where it came from, for example, and understand their evolutionary relationship. So let's take a look at quickly um, what are these elements in a visualization. Okay, so I think this will make it clear um, as to what we are looking at. So what we took was a collection of samples um, some of them are from MERS, so you can see that the orange ones are MERS, then the pink ones are SARS, these red ones are COVID-19, and the green ones are beta coronaviruses. And then we did multiple sequence alignments, and here the different colors indicate how rate of mutation or accumulation of mutations could be studied by bins. So here you have uh, bin size of 500 nucleotides or bin size of 250 nucleotides. And you can see a detailed characterization of change based on a reference, right? So what is a reference genome? The reference genome that we took um, is the COVID-19 from Wuhan wet market that was originally published in uh, January. So here we can see the difference, for example, is more significant between COVID-19, which is not different at all, and for example, MERS, right? Or we can see the difference between, less of a difference between COVID-19 and SARS. But this is in human host, right? So the question is, could we collect the right type of a comparison from publicly available data to study specifically the relationship between different hosts? For example, pangolins, bats, cats, etc. So the answer is yes. The answer is that we can go here and we can find specific data from different types of coronaviruses that infect these different uh, animals as well as humans and study the relationship at the nucleotide as well as the amino acid level. So let's just quickly get there. Um, we'll get there step by step. So here you can see that we performed such analysis as described in this paper. And what are the important findings, right? So here's the same phylogenetic tree that we reproduced from the data that was collected from NCBI. What, how can we interpret this data right here? So here we have SARS coronavirus, SARS coronavirus urbani. So these are different original SARS coronaviruses. Here you can see two bat coronaviruses. Here you have the bad coronavirus rat G13, which if we look for this accession number, we will see that this is a very recent sample from bats deposited uh, in December 2019. And here we have the COVID-19, that original sample, and you can see that they are very closely related and fairly far apart from other ones. Now, with a detailed characterization of these differences, the question is why? right? How are they sim similar? How are they different? So in this paper, they pointed out a specific section of the genome that encodes for the spike glycoprotein. Um, here you can see that spike glycoprotein. Let me quickly show you where to find it on the sequence navigator. If you go to protein compare, and uh, this is going to take uh, a little bit of time to load, so I'm going to let it load, but here you will be able to see the spike glycoprotein. And the spike glycoprotein, once you um, load the surface, you will be able to appreciate the differences specifically coming from the different mutations and understand what are some of these domains, 
right? So where are these differences actually found? So let's take a look. How do we know protein function, first of all? So how do we know that a specific protein is important for a specific function? There are multiple ways of studying, and today we'll focus on just one, but in the future I'll expand on some of the other ways that we can study this. Primarily, we're going to be talking at amino acid sequence similarity, which we can look at similarity at the nucleotide level in the whole genome or the whole sequence of the protein, or a local, a specific region, a specific domain. We can look at the genomic context. So, for example, what types of nucleotides, what types of amino acids is it surrounded by? Or we can look at specific features, for example, subcellular location of the, where that protein is produced or a functional class. So we'll talk a little bit more about how we actually do this. But we have to remember that actually the protein has a 3D structure. And that 3D structure has a lot of information about what is its function, what are some of the open areas of that protein, what are some of the closed areas of that protein. And when we will take a look at some of the mutations that we found, we'll take a look at what is their significant from a 3D structure perspective as well. Another way of studying the impact of these changes is to produce experimental data. And we have access to some experimental data that we'll also discuss in the context of the full program that characterizes the differences in this 3D structure or specific genomic elements and produces real evidence of what changes at the host cell level. So why is this, or how exactly do we know this? Well, amino acids have different physical chemical properties. And those different physical chemical, physical chemical properties define how they interact with surrounding amino acids in the same structure or other amino acids that they bind to, for example. So if we think of the, uh, the structure of the spike glycoprotein, the spike glycoprotein has very specific amino acids that are positioned on places where it interacts or does some functional element of its uh, function, uh, some uh, feature that it is built for. Um, and therefore, we can look at the changes in those types of amino acids when we consider these relationships. So here you can see some of those mutations that are found to be um, present between the bad coronavirus, RADG13, and that first original COVID-19 human sample. So the red ones represent the highly different uh, areas, and the gray means that they are conserved. So first of all, what you can see here is that they are fairly conserved, right? So the conservation between uh, the bat and the human um, is very high. However, there's a specific region on the top view, so you can see the top of this protein, that has a lot of variation. So we'll talk a little bit about what this variation means. Um, let me quickly address some of your questions here. Performing MSA, what could be reference genome? Any sequence from typical corona family or any other? Well, yeah, it depends on the question that you might ask, right? If you have a well-characterized genome, for example, you have a genome from a well-characterized SARS-1, you might use that as a reference. If you want to understand the difference between the novel and the rat or uh, the bat genome, right, you can take one of those. So it really depends on what question you might want to ask of the data. Um, another question, does phylogenetic analysis with different sequences of COVID-19 available in NCBI database and found to be uh, lied in different clades, are they termed as variants? Clades represent consensus between a group. So if you find defined groups that have constant variation, but that is common between that group of samples, eventually over time, those would be characterized as clades, right? Because you need enough sample size. Um, another question, I've heard that coronavirus has been identified three types of strains, A, B, and C, but is not matching in India. Then which of coronaviruses is there in India? Is that correct? So first of all, you need to understand that the number of samples that is available is going to play a huge role in how these different strains are identified. 
Um, up to date, there's not that many. And so as more data comes in, we will better understand the differences and how to categorize them. Right now, I think it's safer to say that there are specific variations found in different locations. The significance of those variations is what's that question? How significant is that variation and what role does it actually play? So I think this context will help you understand. And then later on, once that data becomes available, we can study that data and come to those kinds of conclusions. So where are these variations that we saw in the previous slides? So specifically, those variations are in what's called the receptor binding domain. So this is a part of the ACE2 protein. And you can see how the, the spike glycoprotein opens up and connects to the receptor. And the specific binding domain is where we find a lot of that variation. So how does that process actually happen? This is an illustration produced by uh, folks from uh, one Anstrom uh, that produced the Samson software. And what they were able to produce is a nice little um, animation of how the spike glycoprotein opens up. So you can see that this is the top of the spike glycoprotein. This is kind of like it's at an angle. Um, and you can see how the top one of these opens up to actually connect to the spike glycoprotein, right? So essentially the virus hides that receptor binding domain until it is close to the ACE2 protein when it opens up and then it binds. And that receptor binding causes modifications to the spike glycoprotein that we will talk about in the context of the sequence and the changes that we observe. So where do we find this receptor binding domain? You see it's highlighted right here. This whole protein is separated into two different portions, the top S1 subunit and the bottom S2 subunit. So that's what you can see right here, the S1 subunit and the S2 subunit. You can, have, you can see here the polybasic cleavage site, which is how the top area is connected to the bottom area. And then you can see the receptor binding domain right here. And so based on just several differences in these specific areas, two little areas, we can now think about the relationship between the bat coronavirus, which has an overall similarity, high similarity, right? So whole genome similarity of 98% to the human SARS-CoV-2. However, in these specific regions, the receptor binding domain and the polybasic cleavage site, it is a little bit different. And if it is different, how can we look at other genomes that have higher similarity? And you can see that the higher similarity between the human and the pangolin is specifically found in this receptor binding domain. So in other words, we have three main findings here. One, is the human SARS-CoV-2 that is overall at the whole genome level much closer to the bat rat G13 genome. However, specifically at this region, it is more closely related to the pangolin, right? So you can see the similarity highlighted here. And because of that similarity, we can think of the pangolin as an intermediate host. However, as you are all asking, there is this whole data collection from the outbreak data past that transfer, right? So after the virus came from a different host, it entered the human population and then started evolving in the human population. So the question is, can we use the same approach to understand the human population changes? And the answer is yes. We'll reserve other projects that we've prepared to study some of these ideas for our next sessions. And let me briefly outline some of these topics that we will cover. So the first example that we will use is identification of how these different viral genomes, so you can see here and we will take a look in greater detail, right, at how these different genomes are related and where they are dissimilar. We will also take a look at different aspects of the spike glycoprotein, including 
how this whole cell entry or endocytosis happens, as well as how this protein can evade the immune response and how it causes specific acute chronic reaction at the innate immune level. To do that, we'll also take a look at a previous SARS infection where they took several different uh, aspects of the uh, um, ORF1AB uh, polyprotein, modified them, and studied changes in the cell host response. All of these projects and many more of such studies and examples are going to be available, like I said, in different areas of bioinformatics for infectious diseases. And here I just want to mention that we have partners in Sri Lanka, in India, and in Nigeria, where such programs are being planned right now. Um, some of those links to those programs, if you're from one of those areas, um, are available. So um, let me just uh, post a couple of those programs. If you are in Sri Lanka or in India, um, you can uh, look at a couple of uh, these links. Sorry, I just um, posted that to the wrong person. Um, but we also have an online program that is going to be open to everyone in the U.S. Um, and in Europe. So um, please, um, uh, please uh, look at those links. Again, sorry for um, some of the questions. I didn't have time to look at everything. So um, the question from Dr. Amr uh, Saeed is, um, uh, let me find your question, uh, or maybe you could uh, point out what the question is. I did not see it. Okay. If human can transfer the virus to feline cats because of ACE2, what prevents the vice versa infection? So indeed, one of the biggest concerns is that we have silent carriers, right? So we have carriers like cats um, or dogs, um, that have uh, the virus. And so the differences between hosts is we can detect viral RNA. That does not mean that that virus is causing infection or high levels of replication at the functional level. So again, remember that detection of presence of a viral RNA in a host does not mean that we can detect virions, which are the actual virus particles. So detection of viral, viral RNA, uh, you know, in many of these hosts, they contain a lot of viral RNA in their gut, for example, but it destroys the virion particle. So I think when we speak about transmission, we are speaking about transmission of not the viral RNA, we're speaking about the transmission of the actual virus and that virus having the capacity to cause disease or pathogenesis, right? And so that is an important factor in the cell entry that we are describing here. So multiple factors can actually prevent that uh, process from happening between, for example, uh, pets uh, at home or agricultural animals um, and humans, but it's not ruled out, right? So previously we saw how camels might've been a source of MERS, uh, we saw, um, like you know, avian flu, right, coming from chickens and, and birds. So there are many ways, and we have to look at very specific uh, uh, sequences and very specific, um, you know, uh, transmission points to really characterize that in detail. I think it's difficult to explain that um, in just a couple of minutes. Hopefully that um, explains um, that a little bit better. Sorry, I didn't realize the question was there. Okay. So again, um, I just want to finish with uh, the invitation to uh, the Bioinformatics for Infectious Diseases, where a lot more detail is going to be provided. And the important part of this program is it's not going to be a series of lectures. These are going to be sessions designed to train you to do this type of analysis on your own. Um, briefly, I'll cover a couple of uh, sessions that we will um, use in the program. Uh, we will talk about next generation sequencing basics, how to understand the data itself, and how to map samples directly from hosts before their assembly to identify presence of specific viruses. We will also in detail take a look at 
some of the multiple sequence alignment considerations. How can we utilize different types of multiple sequence alignment methods? How do they vary? And what type of information do they contain, including determination of substrains and haplotypes? We'll talk about preparing and running your pipeline. So how to make sure that the data set that you collect is rigorous. It really represents a condition, a biological condition, and eliminates some of the technical differences. We'll talk about in the context of different types of and, uh, pandemics as well. So here you can see some data from Ebola, some data from coronaviruses, and how to really structure your analysis to get rigorous results. We'll also talk about how do we interpret the pipeline results? So what do these pipelines produce and where to look for so that you can understand all of the process and how to find, for example, technical variation, how to link between different levels of data, how to understand the significance of your findings. We'll talk about the differences between infection and pandemic. So we'll really talk about the process of disease spread, the process of symptom onset, the process of characterization of the disease called the pathogenesis that includes viral outbreaks like we talked about today, but also virus transmission within the human population, cell entry to tissue tropism, and some of the other factors that we need to consider like immunity. Uh, we'll talk about disease progression and outcomes. So we'll talk about how we can find specific regions characterize their evolution or entropy over time, and then look at specific regions that are very important for the uh, characterization or how to fit that characterization of disease with the nucleic acid sequence, dissimilarity, entropy, and other elements. And we'll also talk about how to prepare a project of your own, right? So we will actually talk about the different uh, projects that you can design, um, and how to take those projects from beginning to the end, right? So here we will talk about mutation variant types. Uh, we'll talk about the different uh, findings that have enabled uh, bio, that have been enabled by bioinformatics analysis and produced uh, vaccines. And what are some of the considerations around those vaccines and their effectiveness? Uh, we'll talk about how to use network analysis and uh, machine learning for uh, studying host pathogen interaction, evasion from the host immune response, and some of the other important aspects. And so what we hope as a result of this project, as a result of this program, you will be able to conduct analysis yourself. You'll be able to present your findings to a community of peers that are commonly uh, interested in the same topics and potentially presented at different online um, uh, um, conferences and presentations and get some feedback from real experts in this domain. Um, to support this program, again, like I've mentioned before, we have a collection of tools that are completely online, so you don't have to worry about having a server um, access at your house. You can use everything online, and you will also have access to some of the basic information if you are interested to study this uh, at a deeper level. So again, thank you um, everyone for joining today. Uh, hopefully uh, we will repeat this again soon and we will definitely let you know. And uh, in the meantime, uh, we hope to see you um, in the program uh, again starting on March 4th. And we'll send you the recording uh, of this webinar as well.